Okay, so let's go backwards just a little bit again. Talk to me about the uh, the the gut brain signaling here. You mentioned that you know an inflamed gut can cause changes in your apostat. How exactly does that work? And you know, is it a two way mechanism? Is it a one way mechanism? Let's go into a little science here. Yes, it's a two way mechanism. The gut lining is has these has villi, you know, the finger like projections, and in between the cells you have tight junctions, so food can't get through in between spaces that goes through the cell wall through active transport. And obviously, um, as you as you have a the bacteria the bacteria and the gut also create a blocking of the absorption of insulin. We have a when you have a more diverse amount of plant fibers in your diet, we're saying a variety of natural plants, particularly believe it or not, things like lettuce. Even even a simple thing like lettuce has tremendous protective effects about repairing and building the right type of bacterial milieu and thickening the, you could say, the biofilm that coats the villi. Now, this thickened biofilm that coats the villi, the, the, this layer of bacteria, then slows the absorption of glucose into the bloodstream. So now, then scientists call that the second meal effect. It means that the person's eating, there are four foods that encourage the second meal effect the most. And those four foods are um, raw onion, raw green vegetables, cooked mushrooms and cooked beans. So the two cooked foods and two raw foods that have been most studied for the second meal effect. But the diversity of fibers, even, even and of particularly green cruciferous vegetables and leafy and lettuces have an effect to create a very attractive um, bacterial system that adheres to the lining of the gut better than taking probiotics. When you take probiotics, it doesn't stick and live there. It passes through you. But when you eat right, it creates the fibers. Now, the bacteria break down these fibers into short-chain fatty acids, particularly butyrate. And butyrate becomes a signaler to the hypothalamus to reduce the appetite. So you can say f the breakdown of fiber can lessens your appetite and controls your appetite to a degree. And the, and the right bacteria is helping to break down those fibers into short chain fats like butyrate. When you are eating more processed foods and fried foods and animal and your lack of phytochemicals and plant fibers, then you, your gut uh, microbiome and biofilm becomes thinned out and it becomes more inflamed. You're not exposing these endothelial cells with a high degree of replication. The endothelial cells are like your hair. They're growing all the time. You're sloughing them off and you're digesting them. You have to make new ones. And, you, and, you're making, and the, they're chronically inflamed because they have a higher need for antioxidants and polyphenols and ant, all these things that vegetables give them. So then you have a chronic inflammation in your gut, which, so then, which then sends signals, creates local occurring toxins. And the toxins that are produced by an inflamed gut can pass through the blood-brain barrier and, and interfere with the blood-brain barrier. So a person who has digestive impairment is also going to have headaches and brain fog and mental distress, distress as well, and an excessive consumption for the, for the foods that cause the problem to begin with because it's going to, it's going to make them more, um, they're, it's going to set off their addictions. So the addictions are not only set off by dopamine stimulation, but they're also set off by the addictive behavior and overeating behavior by chronic inflammation in the gut. Also, when, you're, when you have a buildup of a free radicals, we're talking about reactive oxygen species and advanced glycation end products, you also feel shaky and weak and fatigued all the time when you're not digesting food. So that means you, when you try to stop eating, you feel so weak because the liver involves itself with more deconjugating fat-soluble toxins for removal by the kidney and the skin and the, and the, and the respiratory system when they're water-soluble. The kidney, I'm sorry, the liver um, works on reducing toxins to make them water-soluble so the body can remove them. And your body, your liver doesn't do that when calories are coming in. It does that in the catabolic phase, phase when you're not digesting food. So when a person is waiting between a meal and not digesting anymore, three hours have passed, they haven't eaten a meal, and the body starts to repair itself. When they're not healthy and have a lot of inflammation, they feel overwhelmingly fatigued, and they feel like they have to eat to get their energy up. So they're forced to overeat or to eat too frequently to counter the effects of the heightened detox that occurs in a body with chron who's chronically inflamed. So there's a lot of different mechanisms via which eating poorly drives overeating behavior. You know, and, and chewing also. 
you know, people don't chew well enough. If when you're eating these foods that require chewing, when you're eating bacon and eggs, you know, or something like, you know, white bread, you can just suck it in like a straw. It hardly even requires any chewing. But when you're eating big salads and, you know, and prickly pears and, you know, your things are chewy and, and, and hard and, and you got to chew it to, and, and the chewing action also has an effect to create nitric oxide beneficial compounds and it connects and connects with the brain to reduce and control your appetite as well. When you do the right things, you feel comfortable eating the right amount of calories and you feel uncomfortably excessively overeating. When you do the wrong things, you feel uncomfortable eating the right amount of calories and you literally, literally become a calorie consuming monster. I think your explanation of this is one of the most thorough explanations I've heard in a long time. Because you connected many different tissues and sort of like the, the, the physical and biological as well as the emotional experience that I think a lot of people have. I guarantee you that every single person that's listening to this right now is like, oh, yeah, I've been there before. I've been there before. I feel that. Or maybe they feel that right now. And so let's, this is a perfect segue now. People come to your retreat. They are with you for either one month, two months, or three months in San Diego under your supervision 100%. And you see, I mean, I've heard some of the stories, just ridiculous changes in their overall health, in their body weight, in their medication use, in their mental state, in their digestive status, you name it. So give me one or two stories of somebody who's living, let's call it somebody with type two diabetes or somebody with prediabetes. What type of change did you see in them and how quickly did that change set in? The only reason I care about the speed is because a lot of people have the, uh, are sort of believe that if you're gonna change your diet, it's gonna take months. It's gonna take six months, a year before I even feel anything. But the truth is that that's not, that's not the case. So give me some stories here. Um, yes, there's, there's a man, for example, who was a mayor of an East Coast town in the middle, mid-Atlantic states. And he came in here straight from the hospital because in the hospital he had malignant hypertension, which means that his blood pressure was over 240 and even on being put on every blood pressure medication type, beta blockers, H2 blockers, hydralazine, diuretics, alpha blockers, everything, they could not control his blood pressure. So he left the hospital and he arrived here, and plus he had diabetes out of control. He was, his blood sugars were about 300 when he got here, and he was, he was taking like 25 units of insulin, and he was a type 2, on all the oral medications as well. So his blood sugar was out of control over 200, and his blood pressure when he arrived was 240 over 120, right? So I'm saying, what is this guy coming in with a blood pressure of 240 over 120? You know, this is not a hospital, right? You know, this is like, you know, he's not, but okay, so to get to the chase, um, his blood pressure reacted immediately. Even within two days, his blood pressure was starting to come down to a favorable range. I, I had to start decreasing his blood pressure medication and his blood pressure normalized, which in the first 10 days, I weaned him off medications. Just eating this way, his blood pressure came back to normal within 10 days, of and he required no blood pressure medications within 10 days. His kidney was, bur his kidney was in bad shape from all the um, high blood pressure, though. His creatinine was 2.4, representing about 50% of loss of kidney function. So, um, and then, of course, within about two weeks, he was no longer diabetic. His blood sugars were running um, below, you know, between 90 and 100. Within two weeks, he was on no blood pressure medication, no diabetic medication at all. So within 14 days from having malignant hypertension, out-of-control diabetes, within 14 days, his blood pressure is in control, and you could say he's almost no longer diabetic on no medication. That only took 14 days. He's still overweight, still very weak. Still, I took him out for a hike or a bike ride. He really couldn't. He really almost became very, you know, very poor exercise tolerance. As he stayed here over that three-month period, he became more ripped, more fit. He can go with me on bike rides and hikes up the mountains. He really became great, great nice and fit and started to lose a lot of weight. He lost about 50 pounds while he was here. But when I, and he left here at the three-month window, his kidney function still had not come back to normal again. It hardly even changed from like 2.6 to 2.4, still representing that I helped his diabetes and I got rid of his high blood pressure, but I did not fix his kidney. But I stayed in contact with him, right? And over the next three or four months, his kidney came back to normal again. He stayed with the program. He's still staying on the program now. And eventually, and over a little more time, it took longer for the abnormal kidney function to come back. But last I checked, his kidney function had come back to the normal range.
just an example, which took longer than it took to reverse the diabetes. Fair enough. Yeah. So you're basically saying that like certain disease processes take longer to resolve than other disease processes or certain biomarkers, we'll call it, take longer to normalize than other biomarkers. That's right. Particularly the kidney takes a long time to repair itself and you can damage the kidney to such a degree that it's irreparable and people do can require dialysis when they're out of control blood pressure and diabetes. Exactly. So on the, on the CKD tip or on the chronic kidney disease tip, you know, there's varying stages, just like you're saying, there's stage one, stage two, stage three, stage four, end stage renal failure requiring dialysis that can become very problematic. So the advice that people who uh, are developing some combination or, or some stage of chronic kidney disease often get is that they should eat a diet that contains low sodium, low phosphorus, low potassium. Well, guess what? The foods that contain phosphorus, sodium, and potassium are fruits and vegetables. So the advice that they receive is, hey, you should decrease your fruit and vegetable intake you should eat more meat, cheese, fish, and oils. What can we do in this situation? Because you and I both know that that information is actually going to fuel a more dysfunctional kidney. But how can people start to think about their kidney health differently? And is, is that advice even evidence-based? Help me understand. Well, the, they're giving the advice for a really advanced stage renal failure where the potassium is rising and the, you know, there's... Uh, to a person who has a more early stage kidney damage. I don't restrict, I don't feel they should be following and restricting potassium at all. It's just eating a super healthy diet and to be doing what, and, you know, obviously restricting sodium, yes, and restricting um, animal protein and excess protein. But other than that, they're eating and they're pota follow, we're following the potassium. It's in the normal range. If the potassium gets too high, I still wouldn't restrict potassium as it starts. If your kidney's function is so bad, the potassium is, is, um, is rising before we start to leach food and lower the potassium, which we have done. Before we start to do that, we usually would give them something like K-axalate as a potassium absorber in the, in the gut, a fiber that absorbs potassium in the gut that they can then poop out the extra potassium. So I don't really have to go crazy with reducing the potassium in their diet. I just keep them eating healthfully and follow them closely. In this case, as he did not have a high potassium, his creatinine was only 2.4 or 2.6. It wasn't getting up to the level where we were seeing that kind of need to restrict potassium.